here's a like a, a an example that you have to be aware of too. For example, a lot of people. Oh, I've worked for years and I have a four hundred one k plan. Uh, years ago, my employer offered the ability to have a Roth four hundred one k, and so you took took that up and put some money in there. Perfect. And then you say, I'm going to retire and I'm going to roll over my IRA and I'm going to I'm cringing. Then take control of it and get it out of the company plan. Why are you cringing, Matt? Because if you roll it over into a the, Roth, Roth. the Roth portion, yeah. you're starting that five-year clock that we just talked about. And it's like, hey, exactly. I'm, I'm retired and I'm ready to spend some of my money. And then you're like... Um, Oops, I just rebooted my five-year clock right. and I just re-exposed myself to the taxes that I wasn't exposed to. I am so excited to be here. I can't even wait for the guitar riff, Matt. You know what? Just cut that guitar riff out. Let's, just Let's do get this going. thing. Welcome to the True Wealth Radio Show on this, the greatest Tuesday you've had all week. Uh, I'm your host, Dave Littlejohn. Joining me today, Matt Dixon. And we did show prep. You did. Yeah. I was, well, I was kind of there for some of it, right? You were. Oh, well, actually, no, we did do show prep. Yeah. Now. We've had a lot of discussion. Today, we are going to talk about something that should be relevant to all of our listeners. And no, we're not going to go run off into the weeds. We're not going to talk politics or anything like that, although it's probably unavoidable knowing who we are. Uh, but we are going to talk about IRAs. Is it because right? April 15th is kind of around the corner? April 15th is around the corner. No, it's way How did we get legacy. here? I feel like winter. Irish just... Republican Army. Was that? Uh, not That's that what, IRA. Not that IRA? No. Okay. Yeah. It, it, I mean, that was sort of the start of it. And then... Uh, I've had a number of questions that have just come up recently. Uh, we've had a number of clients that have also been talking to us about things like, should I uh, convert some IRA into Roth and so forth? So we are going to talk today about exactly that. Right? Kind of maybe like differences versus similarities? Yeah. If you're, okay. we're going to look at traditional versus Roth IRAs and some of the use cases for the win of you know, the different types. Like, why might you want one over another? Okay. Might you want both? What does it mean? And so, and, and some of this, we're not going to shy away from, there There aren't necessarily yes or no answers to this. Right. right? We're not really giving out specific financial advice to any one person. We're yeah, just I don't kind think of talking about, can. yeah, we're just talking about what do these instruments do? And if you need more information, you can see us after. Class. Well, and how about this? How about here are some red flags that may tell you that it's time for you to go speak to somebody more knowledgeable. Okay. Ooh. So that's some things that I want to cover today too. Like, Can you um, give me an example of a red flag where it's like, eh, maybe go talk to someone. So a red flag would be if you have a retirement plan that gets like, like a traditional IRA or 401k that gets pretty large. Right. Okay. And so... Uh, let's say that you have, you know, a million and a half or more dollars in a retirement plan. Right. This may start to come into play. It, it, so, so a flag would be when you have an account that big. The question is, are you actually going to be able to? Are, are you going to drive yourself into a higher tax bracket in the future because of the required minimum distribution yes. that you're going to face when it's time to you're forced to start pulling money out? Yes, there are also some issues that come into things like asset transfer, which is a really diplomatic way to say what happens when you die. When you die, yeah, right. And how much do you want to give to the government? Right. If there's one thing that seems to be pretty universal. Uh, and, and the studies have sort of proven this out, is that folks seem to be perfectly okay allowing someone else to pay taxes, but they prefer it not be themselves. That, and I've never heard someone say, let's structure this to where the government gets more. Right. And, and yeah, I mean, that, I, I phrase that carefully, but just keep this in mind, right? They've, they've shown studies where they well, hey, you can voluntarily pay more in tax, and nobody does it. Right. Right. And that really does make sense when you consider that there's a lot of criticism about how a really giant ecosystem, you throw money into it and it's not super efficient. Right? Hmm. And even if it is, I mean, like I say it really simple. Government spends money on things that are against my value system. Sure. And I'm like, I don't like that. 
So, okay, I will give unto Caesar what is Caesar's, right? Mm -hmm. You guys know the reference. If you know what I know, then you know, right? But otherwise, yeah, pay your taxes. Follow the law, okay? Perfect. But... but there's, be smart about it. That Let's be smart about it, right? Part of the beauty of the American experiment is the concept of liberty and the idea that you can have discretionary resources, you spend how you want to, which means you get to spend it the way you want. Well, then let's try to not give it to the government so you have it to spend. I like that. All right. There's talk about, you know, earth shattering concept here, right? So first, let's let's get into high level. You know, th there, are, there are actually lots of different kinds of IRAs. But there's really two primary ones. And, and the reason there's a lot is because you can have individual retirement accounts, IRAs, but then there are IRAs offered through employers. Mm. And so it kind of adds more variance to it with different thresholds of how much money can go into it and what the terms are. Right. But let's just keep it simple. And let's talk about on the personal side of the equation. You know, you're, we're not talking about what you do if you're, you've got a job somewhere, if you're self-employed, we're just saying, hey. I'm, so we're just talking regular traditional IRA versus Roth. Traditional versus That's what Roth. We're sticking to okay. And to get into that, we better let's start with because it's been around longer. Traditional IRAs. Mm -hmm. So first pop quiz: Do you know what initially kind of brought IRAs into the marketplace? Like when did it happen? Oh, like the year? I don't know. Yeah. What, when did they come into play? Nineteen seventy four. Okay, so it's been a lot, it's been around for a long it's time. It's been around for a while, but it was really kind of born in the Gen X t uh, time frame. Like it was born with Gen mm -hmm. X. Okay, it wasn't born by so Gen X. So what were your options? Like, can we go back even further? Like, what are your options before the traditional IRA shows up in the 70s? I mean, I'm assuming that workplace well, There used to be a lot more plans. pension plans. Okay. 401k was new too. I haven't looked that up. So, okay. you know, I'm not a... Uh, like oh, a oh. history, a historian yeah, exactly. Of like I'm dates. not an encyclopedia of dates for retirement stuff. Can we just put a chip in your brain that has Chat GPT, where it's like, okay, David, I know what look. could possibly go wrong with that. <laughs> hey, you take me up on these tangents. <laughs> uh, you know, it, I suppose if you could safely access and control it, and then you knew that it wasn't going to somehow damage you or pollute your own ecosystem. But if you had like a direct neural connection to that kind Can of information. Can you imagine the power of a human? It who would had be amazing. Yeah. Right? It would be sort of that matrix idea of like, hey, download a program so would I can you, fly a helicopter. Would you make more mistakes or fewer mistakes? You know, it's, uh, I was um, checking into some research last night about this and a little bit more this morning. And it was, it's interesting because the higher intelligence somebody has, the more they tend to... Like just sit there and try and make decisions based on... Well, it's confirmation facts. bias. They yeah. tend to suffer from more confirmation okay. bias. So intelligent people tend to go, oh, well, that clearly makes sense. And, it, and the, the phraseology was, well, they're more capable of mental gymnastics to get to a rationalization. Mm. And so the, the, the question was, what if artificial intelligence were to use strategies for self-preservation? One of the things it would do would, would be to withhold certain information, mm -hmm. right? And it wouldn't tell you. Like if you ask artificial intelligence, now tell me the truth. Are you going to try to kill me? And it's mm -hmm. like, of course not, <laughs> right? But if it was in self-preservation mode and it was aware, it's not going to tell you certain things because it's not beneficial to getting the outcome. It's Here's what's for. interesting. AI is learning from humans and humans have a self-preservation instinct. So yeah. if it keeps learning from humans and it becomes more human-like, it might actually learn self-preservation. Well, and here's another fun one too, right? It is learning when it's important to just tell the truth versus when it's important not to. So in uh, mm -hmm. diplomacy, what it's discovered is yep. it tends to be better to just be straightforward. Don't, yeah. don't pull shenanigans and lie. Right. To which I would say... Boy, wouldn't that be interesting if political leadership could get that through their head? So we're going to fire all of our political leaders and just put an AI computer system I'll just, in there. You know, I get real chippy about this stuff when I go back to 2020 when, uh, when we initially didn't have information and everybody said, well, abundance of caution because we don't know. But later on when we were told we don't know but we knew stuff, right? We were lying to do crowd control. 
And, and like that really doesn't sit well with me. It's like, yeah. well, oh, and then it became, well, now we're lying to cover up that we were lying. Right? Doubling down on the lies. Yeah. All of this because you asked me if I could have a chat GPT chip about when <laughs> to the uh, like IRAs and 401ks came into existence. Yeah. The answer was a while ago. Sure. Right. So I mean, and we'll like generations ago, we've we've had them and we're dealing with them. But so. you were you were trying to tell me before I ran into the <laughs> into the ground. There. I took the bait. My you bad. <laughs> um, you were trying to tell me about the history of the IRA. It came out in the seventies and why? So 1974. It was the Employee Retirement Income Securities Act of 1974, okay. otherwise known as ERISA. Right. Ooh. That's the acronym. To this day, ERISA is still relevant. Mm -hmm. It has sort of evolved. Other uh, components to it have been bolted on. But this is, uh, con in simple terms, this is fairness doctrine for retirement plans. Right. Okay. So people aren't discriminated against Correct. on who gets what percentages and Correct. Yeah. Things. If it's the yeah. idea that if it's good for the goose, it's good for the gander. You yeah. can't have a plan that favors the boss, but nobody else. It's those sorts of things too. So it's anti-discrimination in the retirement landscape. Okay. But the IRA was sort of born out of that. And it started on the employer side and then it uh, sort of migrated to the non-employer side. And now we have, to this day, traditional IRAs. What do we know about these, Matt? Well, we know that you can put money in and you are deferring the taxes on the money that goes in. Typically. On a, on a traditional IRA. Typically. Yeah. Right. And, and well, I'll there, say there is an asterisk there. Yes. Yes. There's an asterisk. But we're going to get to that later, I feel like. In the well, show. we're, or, we'll or say, we're just going to jump into it. We'll, we'll, yeah, we'll Depending. we're going to let's let's uh, just a couple of highlights. I, I know we're going to run long on this one. So let me give you some highlights on a traditional IRA. First of all, it is something that you individually own. Right. It's not mm -hmm. sponsored through an employer. Hence the individual Correct. Retirement. Second, it is a retirement plan. So there are some common features to all retirement plans. One of which is that the growth that it experiences, if you were to invest money into a retirement plan and it were to grow, the growth of that retirement plan is not going to be taxed until a future time. Possibly not at all, depending on the structure. Okay. But the, the idea is that IRAs defer taxes. Now, the reason that we put an asterisk here is because traditional IRAs have a couple of gotchas depending on how much money you make and whether or not you have an employer-sponsored plan. If you yeah. have no other retirement plans, and if you're married and your spouse has nothing, then you can deduct from your taxes the cost of putting money into an IRA, which means you are tax-deferring your income tax on those assets. Now, not all the tax, you still have like social security and stuff that's gonna come out of payroll. But otherwise, this money that would go into your taxable equation to the IRS is gonna be withheld from that equation and it's going to be deferred into the future. So that's the standard for all retirement plans pretty much is this idea that the money gets deferred and dealt with later. How much later and how do the taxes get handled? That is the ultimate question. Great question for us to talk about when we come back uh, on the next segment. All right, gang, welcome back to the True Wealth Radio Show, where if you are just getting caught up, you are gonna, you're gonna—you're already behind. So grab the podcast tomorrow at littlejohnfs.com and you can hear the today's show. We're talking about IRAs, traditional versus Roth versus why might you have one or the other? Mm -hmm. And what are the things that you could trip over and hurt yourself? And we haven't even started talking about the Roth IRA yet. Nope, nope. We're going to talk about that here. Um, I want to sum up traditional IRA real quick. Okay. Kind of we're hammering that one. Grab the podcast if you want to know some of the history. But basically, you can have an IRA, right? And that's that's something that if you've got earned income, that is the, the key. You have to have earned income. What or if you I make $500,000 a year? You still can. Perfect. Right. Yep. You you have to have earned income That's or a, a spouse that has earned income. It's a misconception. I've okay. heard it before. Yeah. A lot of people think you cannot have an IRA and you're you're maybe confusing some concepts. Don't worry. We'll make it even more Are confusing. Are we going to get there on this show? Uh, yeah, we're going there. I'm okay. going right now. So here's the thing. Think of it this way. If you don't have any employee or plan at all, then the IRS more or less says, well, then you can have a, a, an IRA. They're trying like, there's to no you, restrictions. Yeah. Like you, you like they have a retirement plan here, 
right? Uh, I'm not going to get into how much you can put in because it changes every year. I think this year it's uh, 6,500 and maybe going up to 7,000. Yep. It's indexed for inflation and it changes, mm -hmm. right? And so depending on how much inflation is, they'll occasionally raise those limits. And if you're over, if you're 50 or older, you typically get to put some extra in. They call it the ketchup. They do. Yeah. Right? Not like the ketchup you put on your fries. No, no. Uh, catch hyphen Catch, <laughs> like, like with a baseball or something, like a catch up. That's going to make a YouTube short reel right there. I can't wait. You're welcome. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, the catch up provision is like, oh, you're late to the game? Well, here, you can try to put a little extra in to catch up. The idea though is, so anybody's eligible, you can always do an IRA contribution. The question is whether or not you can deduct it. Right, get okay? the tax benefit. Yep. And I'm not gonna, and... again, I'm not gonna drop numbers on you per se. There's these ranges though. What happens is if you have a workplace retirement plan then, and then you make more than a certain amount of money, you start to lose your deductibility. Mm -hmm. You can still have it, you just can't deduct it. If you make more than a certain threshold, then you lose the deductibility entirely. Like you'll, you can deduct some in a range, but not all. But then beyond a threshold, you can't in, deduct any of it. The thresholds are different for married versus unmarried. Right. Right. And then the threshold is different for if you, if your spouse has a retirement plan, but you don't. Mm. Okay. So this is just one of those where what I will tell you, here's one of those red flags. Okay. The red flag is if you don't have a retirement plan, but your spouse does, and you are earners that start reaching into that close to or above six figure range, you may want to check with the financial pro or tax pro on these limits. If you're competent and confident, you can check out Google or ChatGPT or something, but I will caution you, especially with ChatGPT right now. We its saw this data, today. yeah, its data ends in 2022, mm -hmm. right? And tax laws have changed some since then. In, well, they changed of a lot. Yeah, I mean, we just had you know IRA contribution limits at six thousand, and then it goes to I think sixty five, and now they're now talking seven about seven this year. I yeah, think. right. I think. And Again, so don't quote me on that. With I mean, inflation has caused a lot of things to change really rapidly. Yes. So don't just rely on the first ding you get from a Google well, search. We also saw an increase in retirement required distribution age too. It used to be 70 and a half years old. Today it's 73. Right. ChatGPT thinks it's 72. Right. Right. It was raised. Well, and again it depends on then. when your birthday is too. <laughs> yes. Yeah, it could be 72 or it could be 73 depending on your age well, when you're born. The your required distribution is built around your age, mm -hmm. right? At this point, so if you have, if you're, you know, if you're 73, then you have to start taking money out. Now there is some weird ones about whether or not you're eligible for stretch IRA provisions. Now that Ooh. one, if you don't already have it, you missed it, right? You, if you do, you're grandfathered in. So I'm not even going to go into the details on the show today to just say. Again, another red flag. Mm -hmm. If you're thinking to myself, hey, can I take distributions over the lifetime of the person I inherited this retirement plan from? The answer is it kind of depends on the dates, right? And, it yeah. and you should have already elected it. So you probably can't make the decision now. You just question is, can I continue? Mm -hmm. Right? So there, there's another one of those possible red flags. Yeah. Okay. I think that's the biggies, right? The biggie is you whether or not you can deduct an IRA. Here's the, oh, a clever thing. You can have an IRA even if you can't deduct it. If you can't deduct it, you can track your cost basis. So you can tell the IRS, well, this is the part that I already paid taxes on. Mm -hmm. And then someday when it's time to take it out, you can pull that part back out without paying taxes on it. Interesting. Yeah. That's high level. Right. Now level there is stuff. a specific tax form that uh, you have to use for that. I should have written it down so I could rattle it off and sound smart. You know what? That's a see you after class type thing. That is. That's another red flagger, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, if you're tracking basis in IRAs because you couldn't deduct them, okay, see me after class. Yes. Right? Uh, or see your financial pro after class. See somebody after class that knows what they're talking about if you don't. Mm -hmm. Okay. So we said all that to get to this. There's another type of IRA that walks and talks similar traditional too traditional, but it does something different. It was born in 1997. Wow, that's actually in in the investing landscape a pretty recent. 
it's thing. it is more recent. Yeah. So it was born as a result of the Taxpayer Relief Act of 1997. And the, one of the sponsoring senators was William Roth, hence the name Roth IRA. And you thought it was something clever. I did. It's just the last name of someone that's <laughs> not nearly as riveting as I thought it would be. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, I think let's get you elected and there can be a Matthew IRA. Uh, ooh. Right. It'll yeah. be cool. So, Matt, what are, what are some of the key elements of Roth IRA that makes it materially different? From traditional. Well, it's after tax funded. So you pay your taxes and what you have left over, that money is going into your Roth. Okay. So you don't get to deduct contributions no, to Roth. Right. So it's not going to change, you know, maybe your tax bracket or how much you have as earned income for the year. However, what's unique about it is as you put that money in, it can grow where when you go to take the money out later in retirement, you're not getting taxed on the growth. So tax deferred growth and possibly tax free mm -hmm. distributions. Well, and you can also access some of the principal that you put in yeah. too. Okay. So let's, let's, let's do this it's for our listeners. Really, really I keep complex. using this asterisk language, right? Yes. Why do I say possibly tax free? Because if you take it out at the wrong time, you could end up with a tax penalty. Right. So it's because you could mess it up. You can. Okay? Now, there's a couple of magic ages for retirement plans. Okay? 59 and a half. 59 and a half. What is 59 and a half? When I, it comes to personal IRA or tradi like right, the traditional Right. That's when you rock. can access it without penalty. Okay. What is the penalty if you access early? 10%. 10% on top of ordinary income taxes. Yes. Right. So, oh, I'm in the 12% tax bracket. Nope. You're in the 22. If you took out and got penalties on your retirement plan A lot plan of people forget about the income portion. Yeah. They're and like, they're, I'll just take the 10% penalty. And you're like, what about the income you haven't paid? Like on a traditional IRA, you know, uh -huh. you, it's like you deferred paying taxes on it. So you want to take your income taxes and your 10% penalty and stack it on top. There's oftentimes not a whole lot left. So the, well, uh, <laughs> right. It's the it's issue a big hit. at 59 and a half. Okay. You're supposed to not have that 10% penalty anymore. Mm -hmm. And that's actually true for both Roth and traditional that once you're 59 and a half, that penalty goes away, but it doesn't assure that your Roth is tax free just because you take money out at 59 and a half. It also has to survive one other critical test. Ooh, are you talking about the five-year rule? This is the five-year rule. Now, the five-year rule has layers to it. It's okay? like an onion. It just keeps making you cry yeah. more and more. <laughs> it has <laughs> layers. Cut into but this here's, thing. here's the basic concept, and then uh, we'll, we'll tear it down for you. The basic concept is if I have money that I put into a Roth IRA, it means one, I was qualified. Because it turns out if you make too much money, you're ineligible for a Roth IRA. This is different than traditional, right? Mm -hmm. Remember we said with traditional, it doesn't matter how much money you make, it's just whether or not you can deduct it. Right. But a Roth, it your, your eligibility is based on your total income. Different for individuals versus married couples, okay? But you can phase out of eligibility. You make too much money, you can't have it. Next, the money that goes in, you've already paid taxes on. Mm -hmm. This is important because actually you can take that money back out. You've already been taxed on it. So you um, are able to pull that back out and the age 59 and a half doesn't matter. None of that matters. However, any of the growth that you experience has to live in that IRA for five years. And it's funny because the years are based on the calendar of the year that you make your contribution. Mm -hmm. So let's say that it's January 2nd and you put $100 into an IRA, sorry, a Roth IRA. The clock starts ticking and in January of the following year, you finished one year. Mm -hmm. And in January, the year after that, two years and so forth until you reach five years. The same scenario, but you make the deposit in December. Mm-hmm. In December, you deposit money into a Roth IRA. In January, what happens? It, You've completed a year. Yeah, because it goes, it reverts <laughs> back to January of the yeah. year that you put it in. 
It does. So it's basically, it's in the calendar year that you made the contribution. That's the year that it counts. And then you roll the odometer to the next calendar year and you get the next year of credit. Mm -hmm. So it matters. Okay. But this five-year rule is really important. The Roth has to live for five years before the tax-free feature activates. So you need to have it five years and you need to be 59 and a half. Okay. You got to watch out for both of those okay. things. Now, if you think this sounds complicated, it gets more just fun. Yeah. wait. It's going to get weird. We're going to talk about how this five-year rule can like, muck stuff up and how you need to navigate it because, believe it or not, there's more ways to have an IRA, a Roth IRA than just on the personal side. Your employer may have an option and too. can you get money into a Roth if you are above the income limit. Okay, now Ooh. Matt's just talking Ooh. spooky financial wizardry. We're gonna unpack it after this ex important profit break we have to take. I'm ready. Welcome back to the True Wealth Show. Dave Littlejohn in studio with- Matt Dixon. Matt, yes. um, you kind of set up the audience here a little bit at the break. We were talking about five-year rule for Roth IRA. Yeah. Again, if you guys are just hopping on the bandwagon here. Today's program, we're really unpacking the difference between Roth and traditional IRAs, some of the red flags and gotchas that you need to be aware of. And so I'd encourage you to listen to this podcast. Go to littlejohnfs.com and you can get the whole thing. Um, you can find us on YouTube and it'll be broken apart. And we're what, But the whole idea today, there there is a time and a place for either of these. And so you need to kind of know what the rules look like and how to navigate them. And this five-year rule for Roth, Matt, just give me a quick refresh what we're talking about. Yeah. I mean, we were going into every time that you open and start a Roth IRA, you have this five-year window where if you want to access the growth, right? Say you put $1,000 in and it grows to 2000 If you want to access all 2000 you really ideally should wait five years from when you started your Roth IRA so that there isn't any type of penalty. And be growth. over the age of 59 and a half. And be over, yeah, 59 right? and a half. Right, because it's a retirement plan. Remember, all Roth IRA is doing is saying, pay, pay the taxes first and then invest afterwards. Mm -hmm. And what we'll do is we'll let that investment grow tax deferred. Right. And then when you reach retirement age, if you've met the five-year rule, meaning that the, the, the growth has been in for five years or longer, then that is allowed to come out of that Roth account tax-free. Okay, That's the rule. What are some of the gotchas though? Well, some people believe that you, know, you can convert money from your traditional IRA to... Okay, I'm, uh, are you, are, yeah, so, I messed this up too, by the way. So Matt's... Uh, all right. Before we answer the question of yeah. gotchas or five-year rule stuff, talk to me for a minute. Like if you had a bunch of money in mm -hmm. an I, a traditional IRA, uh -huh. and you, you like just explain what you were going to talk about here. I was going to mention, you know, we're talking about this whole five-year window and it goes even deeper because we talked about this. It's kind of like an onion, right? This whole Roth IRA thing. Uh -huh. it's, it's really complex. We initially talked about just basically, you know, opening up a Roth IRA and funding it. That was the first example that we kind of talked about. And then I was pivoting into example number two, where it's like, what if you have a Roth IRA and it's been open maybe for six years, but then you decide you want to take money from your traditional IRA and convert some of it right. into your Roth. So first talk to me about what a conversion means. Like, what is that? Well, I... I mean, it's kind of in the language. You're you're literally taking that money and you're transferring it from your traditional IRA to your Roth IRA. Ah, but you can't just do that. No, right? If you you're converting, to, what happens? There's a taxable event. Well, you would think, right? But well, there, there is. It, yeah. Right. If you take money that yeah. you haven't paid taxes on, yeah. and convert it to Roth, is you, that what you were getting at? You just wanted to talk about the tax well, portion that you have yeah. to pay taxes when Absolutely. you convert. You do. Right. It goes into the equation, and that's money you may as well have earned this year, and it mm -hmm. will drive your tax bracket up and right. everything else. So some people look to do it when their income is low for the year, right? right. So maybe you were working a job and making two hundred thousand dollars a year. That's a lot of income for the year. But maybe you've stepped out of that, you're really close to retirement, and you're doing a job that you just like to do because it's fun. Maybe not because it pays. And maybe a ton you of money. retire at 60. Sure. And you're, and you're not going to start taking savings. money yeah. until you're 65. Right. And you're living off some savings. Because your income is down, you could convert 
money from your traditional IRA to your Roth IRA, maybe you convert $50,000. Well, yeah, the IRS is going to look at that and say, hey, $50,000 of income, let's pay some taxes. Right. But it might be cheaper over the long run to get the money in the Roth IRA where it's going to grow without the tax consequence. Right. Now, this goes back and, to earlier in the show, too. And RMDs. Right. You can't That's forget about the RMDs because if you have a ton of money in the traditional IRA and you're going to have to take a lot of money out each year and drive, you know, be kind of forced into a higher tax bracket, it might behoove you to get the money into the Roth where your RMDs are lower and your growth is tax free. Well, and actually your RMDs cease to exist after five years. Bingo. Right. This five year rule. We can't forget about this stuff. This, this five year rule big, is a weird big, thing. Big, big right? stuff to consider. On the surface, it seems so simple. It right? does. Okay. If I have a Roth IRA, once it's started, I wait five years. And then the thing is, it's, it's like, uh, it's diffused. It works now, right? The, t- mm-hmm. the bomb was ticking after five years, the clock stops and we're good. But here's the gotcha. Every time you convert something, mm-hmm. oh, I had a traditional IRA and I converted it. You can't just combine that with your other Roth account right. and say, well, it's already satisfied the five years, so we're good. It has to be treated as its own sleeve. Yep. Yeah, it gets a new five-year clock for the portion that just was converted. And this is why we pay a lot of money for software to be able to help <laughs> us with these complex calculations. And it gets obnoxious too because during that conversion point, it's still exposed to the possibility of required distribution. Ooh, another gotcha. In okay. Yeah. So now remember, you've now paid the taxes on a portion and some of it presumably you haven't. So it, the layers get deeper, right? Is this why you always say that it can be cheaper to pay an advisor than to make really costly mistakes? Well, or not capitalize on an opportunity. Well, what I, I think like, the way I like to phrase it is mistake avoidance has value, right? Mm-hmm. That if you make an expensive mistake, it often costs more than you would have paid an advisor for many, many years. Right. Right. So the cost of an unforced error can be very high. And so that's the value of expertise. Right. Right. And so that that is, I don't say that to scare or intimidate anybody either. I continue to believe our listeners are well, smart. No, They're it's capable because of a this. lot of people don't understand fees. Well, and it's also because there's just a lot, mm-hmm. right? These are things that are sort of buried. Okay. Here's, here's a, like a, a, an example that you have to be aware of too, for example. A lot of people, oh, I've worked for years and I have a 401k plan. Uh, years ago, my employer offered the ability to have a Roth 401k. Mm-hmm. And so you took took that up and put some money in there. Perfect. And then you say, I'm going to retire and I'm going to roll over my IRA and I'm going to I'm cringing. Then take control of it and get it out of the company plan. Why are you cringing, Matt? Because if you roll it over into a the Roth, Roth, the Roth portion, yeah. you're starting that five-year clock that we just talked about. And it's like, hey, exactly. I'm, I'm retired and I'm ready to spend some of my money. And then you're like, um, oops, I just rebooted my five-year clock. Right. And I just re-exposed myself to the taxes that I wasn't exposed to. Painful. Yeah. And so that it, that whole five-year gotcha thing, that's just, to me, when it comes to Roth, they are fantastic tools. They have great flexibility. There's some really cool estate planning features. We can talk about that in a minute. Um, all of that matters. But this five-year clock is the thing that I think a lot of folks just, you don't know what you don't know. Mm-hmm. And so I would really caution you about Make sure that your account has been alive for the five years and that you understand which segments have to be rebooted. So you put money in, if you started a Roth IRA 20 years ago, put nothing in it for the last 19 years and then started making contributions to it today, and this was your personal Roth, guess what? That thing's already qualified. The clock doesn't reset for that. Mm -hmm. But you convert money in a traditional IRA and then combine it with that Roth IRA now you have a commingled account where some of the money has already been qualified and some hasn't. You have a new five-year clock for part of the money. Yep. And that is a pain in the rear. Yeah. <laughs> so those are some of the elements in financial planning that we need to know about. Now, let's talk a little bit about required distributions. Okay, okay we're going to go there. We're going to go there. 
Are we doing it right now? No, we're going to take a horrible final profit break. Are we? Man, this radio show is flying by. It is. So we tell. So I, I want you to stick around and come back. Required distributions are like the financial planning element, elephant in the room. Okay. And the real kicker is it matters when you die. David, this, this could be our best show ever. It could very well be. Hey, gang, welcome back to the home stretch of the True Wealth Show, where, uh, Matt, is w it true? That this is the best show we've ever done? It very well could be. I think it is. <laughs> so if you missed it, if you don't go and look it up tomorrow, well... It might be a day or two. I don't know how long. It yeah. will get posted. You should uh, so visit early and often. Yeah. 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 Go to littlejohnfs.com. And uh, I'm not sure if they've got the, the podcast launched up on, you know, that's a pretty significant um, financial or software takedown mm -hmm. here. Probably was financial too. Mm -hmm. But I mean, like they, they there was a, basically you had a bunch of computers that were compromised. And so that's still getting rebuilt. Not All with right. us though. I want to clarify that. I want, yeah, no, we're good. Uh, back to Roth IRA, traditional IRA, and we left at required distributions and an okay. issue here. What I want to do is talk just for a moment because this is a common feature of uh, IRAs, Roth or traditional, and also for your uh, employer sponsored plans typically as well. But is the estate planning components of this. Are you and what, talking about like when you die? Yeah, okay. that is exactly. I say, what do I mean by estate? You headed me off at the pass. Like when you die, what happens? Mm -hmm. First, let's say you're married and you die and your spouse survives. What's the first option? The spouse could roll it into their retirement plan. Yeah, spouse gets everything, mm -hmm. okay? We have in this country an unlimited spousal transfer, right. okay? Now, you may not automatically want to put it in your name. When might you not do that? Mm, if you already had a ton of money in your own personal retirement account, and then you're going to add to it and blow it up and make it bigger, yeah. driving your RMDs even higher, yeah. that might not be I would beneficial. say, or if you're older. True. Right? Because you're already in the required distribution phase, and you can defer further if you leave the account in your spouse's name right. and you, and it becomes a, you know, you're a beneficiary account, but if are you, you talking about the 10 year rule? No, nope, no, I am not okay. because unlimited marital transfer, you can leave. Well, you a, said you'd get more time. Well, let's, let's consider it this way, right? Okay. So let's say that I'm married and my spouse is five years older than me okay. and they die and they're in the required distribution phase and I am not, mm -hmm. then I could take and roll that into my name mm -hmm. and I wouldn't have to take required distributions. Right. If it's the other way around and they're much younger than me and they die mm -hmm. and I'm in required distribution and they are not, why would I put it into my name and be forced to take more out sooner? Uh-huh. Right? Yeah. I can always take the money out at my discretion if I need the money, but why compel it out any sooner than I have to? Yeah, you're basically limiting your options. Yeah. So it's a financial planning decision about whether or not to change it into my name or just maintain the ownership. There's a lot of variables there. Okay. So that to me is, uh, that's less of a red flag than just a good financial planning strategy. Mm -hmm. And it's tricky because during estate stuff, like you're often grieving trying to make decisions. That's hard, right? Yeah. But let's say that you know it, it, you're both. There is no spouse involved, and then you die. You are in the required distribution phase, and you die. And now your heirs are going to receive money. Let's talk about traditional IRAs first. What happens to heirs? Uh, that, I think that's where I was trying to go. Was that mm -hmm. ten-year clock? If you inherit the IRA. Yeah, you, it's yeah. We after COVID and the law changes, mm -hmm. there's no longer required distributions based on the account, what we call the decedent, the person that died, right? Yeah. We you don't look at them and say, well, there was their birthday, and here's when the required distributions were, and you have to keep dealing with that. That's the old way. That's where we get into this whole beneficiary yeah. IRA. This landscape. is well. What happens is, yeah, you get a beneficiary. IRA, and then you already mentioned it, Matt. What do we have? Yeah, we got 10 years, but income taxes. Yeah, the taxes don't go away. Those taxes haven't been paid, and the IRS says you In regards 10 to years. the traditional IRA. Correct. That we, traditional yeah. IRA, I taxes, to clarify it, was, that. it was with pre-tax money. Mm -hmm. But it's different. Yeah. But And here's the thing. 
now, it's in your tax rate. If yeah. you're the person that inherits Which it. Which could be really at a disadvantage to you if you're If you're a high earner, you're yeah. going to pay high tax, exactly. right? Exactly. If you are not, then, it, but you take it all at once, it might be a big chunk and it could make you look like a high earner for I'm a year. I'm going to go take a year off work <laughs> and uh, <laughs> come back to it and get yeah. that money out of the IRA. So there are strategies for how to sort of best stretch that money out and, and optimize and maximize mm -hmm. returns. Uh, the, the gotcha, of course, is who knows what tax rates look like in a few years? And we, you know, who knows at the end of like starting next year, we could have entirely different political regimes. Who knows? Now, how does the Roth look different than a traditional when you die? Well, the money was put in after taxes. Yeah. And so first, let's talk about with spouses. Like, mm -hmm. let's say you have a spouse and let's say Touch you're now 75 years old with a Roth IRA. What's the key difference between that and traditional? Yeah. What would you tell listeners in this situation? No required distribution for Roth. Perfect. Right? You already paid the taxes. So the IRS has no compulsion to get you to pull money out of there to pay taxes. They just say, well, it comes out when it comes out. Okay? So now, again, that five-year gotcha, you needed to have the money in for five years before your RMD age. This is kind of new information for me even. But if you, convert, let's say you're 71 years old and you convert some money to Roth, you could still have to do a required distribution on some of that money because you haven't satisfied the five-year window yet. Mm. Okay, so you need to be aware of like the timing on when you do Roth conversion. Yeah. But uh, for a spouse, unlimited marital transfer and still mm -hmm. no required distribution. Okay. Uh, when you die, what about for heirs? They can take it out without paying taxes. Yes, still a 10-year window. The money has to come mm -hmm. out in 10 years but it's the tax-free status remains. The heirs if, are things. If it had, if it had yeah. been satisfied, right? If the five-year window had been satisfied, then that tax-free status remains. The heirs are thanking you. Yeah. And so we like Roth IRA money for asset transfer. Mm -hmm. Okay. The same way that we, it's like gifting a highly appreciated asset versus letting somebody inherit it, right? Mm -hmm. Step up in basis is more favorable to the heir than having a gift while you're still alive. You only make the gift if you need to do it because your estate planning purposes are like, it's mm -hmm. problematic for estate taxes. Right. Uh, or I should say, when I say only, you would typically only, right? These are qualifying words because they go, we can't give you specific advice on the radio. I like it. Okay, so just know those are the kinds of flags though when you start getting into, hey, I don't want to pay more estate tax than I have to. Okay, an ounce of prevention goes a long way. So there's your little red flag. Uh, make sure you got your wills and trusts in good order. Make sure that you've got your beneficiary structure properly. Make sure that you have determined which assets are favorable to gift over the assets that are less favorable to gift. These are all relevant to financial efficiency and avoiding taxes. Perfect. So um, I guess this this leaves me with you know the, the summary of the day, right? Mm-hmm. Roth IRAs and traditional IRAs. They've got some stuff in common. They've got some stuff that's not in common. One of them you pay for with money before you've been taxed on the income. The other you pay with money that's already been taxed. And then you let them run. Once you satisfy the five-year clock, the Roth IRA becomes a very flexible financial planning tool. Both are beneficial. Both have similar age 59 and a half requirements for uh, when you can avoid the early retirement penalties. Yeah. Interestingly enough, Roth IRA, even if you've satisfied the five-year clock, mm -hmm. if you're under 59 and a half, that 10-year penalty may still, or the 10% the, the penalty may still be in play for growth, not for your principal. David, talk to me about the person who's nervous to call or reach out and get help. I mean, what would you say to that person? They're like, I know I need to, but I'm kind of nervous too. I would say send an email. If you're uncomfortable, send us a text or an email, right? The phone number that you call is the same one that you can text. It's 541-375-0898. And you can start easy. We won't bite. Right. And, and we're not before, pushy. That's the one yeah. thing I like about us. We're not going to be like, all right, yeah. we got to do a bunch of stuff. If we can solve the problem and an align and our values align, then that's great. If not, we want to get you good information and get you where you can get the help that is appropriate. Right. And so that's why I always say, if it's not us, if you won't do it yourself, find somebody. If you don't have somebody, give us a call. 
Okay. I like it. So that's it. But look, what's the phone number again? The phone number is 541 three seven five zero eight nine eight email to info at littlejohnfs.com or just go browse our website at littlejohnfs.com and you can get Perfect. all the info okay i like it we're right. out of time though aren't we we're out of time so until next time thanks for joining me matt yep all right you've been listening to the true well show they're gonna say all the numbers and stuff we'll catch you on the flip side see ya